everybody for joining. Um, again, the name is Justin Webster. Um, I'm from uh, Inflow Technology, which is a division of Computer Aid Technology, and, and our focus is on um, SOLIDWORKS PDM and other types of PDM uh, and PLM applications. Um, uh, this is a replay of a presentation that we gave at uh, 3D Experience World this year in Nashville. And uh, joining me at that presentation was Lucas Luff, who is the global administrator for Smith's Interconnect. Uh, Lucas is not able to participate today, but um, um, I'll be going through his content. And um, and so please, uh, as uh, like uh, Josh mentioned, please send any chat questions that you have, um, or we can, uh, or if you have questions um, uh, that you'd like to uh, send me, I'll provide my email address at the end of the presentation so you can send those to me. Or if you have questions specific for Lucas that's misinterconnect on some of that material, uh, you could forward those to me as well, and I'll get those uh, uh, to Luke as well. Um, so uh, during the presentation, uh, here is um, going to be our focus. Um, uh, we're going to be going through SQL replication as it relates to SOLIDWORKS PDM Professional. Um, this functionality added a few releases ago. Um, we're going to go through SQL replication setup and configuration and uh, SQL replication justification. Um, to give you a little bit of my background, um, um, I'm the vice president for our inflow technology team. Um, uh, we're a large team of uh, consultants and support um, uh, technical folks that um, help our customers uh, deploy these types of tools like SOLIDWORKS PDM, SOLIDWORKS Manage, 3D Experience. Um, Lucas is not joining us today, like I mentioned, but he's the uh, Glo Global Engineering Systems Admin for Smith's Interconnect. Um, and you can look up Smith Smith's Interconnect online. There's a little detailed uh, description of what they do uh, uh, provided as well here. Um, so just to be able to give you a bit of an overview of database replication, um, lots of um, administrators who use SOLIDWORKS PDM are familiar with the file replication elements of SOLIDWORKS PDM, where we can synchronize files and very, you know, live very large files across the world uh, at, at different sites. Um, a few releases ago, um, database replication was introduced. And uh, really, it comes down to the following issue. Um, users at remote locations uh, see performance degradation. So they see things that are, that would normally, at maybe a primary site, um, take longer for the end users at remote sites. And so um, depending on, let's say, the, um, the, the network conditions, this can be either really impactful or not as much. And so um, this issue was brought to SOLIDWORKS um, some years ago um, as a way to, um, uh, and as a way to deal with that issue, replication was introduced. Um, uh, in addition uh, to kind of that remote scenario, we do in see instances where there are a lot of concurrent users in, a, in working in a vault. So let's say there's hundreds and hundreds of users and during peak usage, um, there might be large searches taking place and that's also then impacting other users uh, in the system as well. And so, we call those expensive operations. And so if you're running a search that's going to return 10,000 results, that might be an expensive operation to run on your system. And so also SQL replication is really meant to address that issue as well. So these primary issues. To really see how it affects the user experience, we'll focus on that first issue here, and that's latent and and that's remote locations, typically tied down to latency and bandwidth. And so you can see from a local person um, where something might take, you know, five seconds or less than five seconds, like a checkout, it might take over 15 seconds remote. Um, <clears throat> things like searching, things like browsing. So things that are require a lot of references back to your primary site um, can be impacted a lot by latency. Bandwidth has some effect, but generally speaking, it's latency that has the biggest effect. And these different tests were run off of um, um, off a remote location with, you know, something like 100 millisecond latency, which would be fairly common for, let's say, U.S. to Europe. So why is it slower? Well, generally speaking, it's slower because of the architecture. So those remote users are coming all the way back to a um, 
a central database server, which is which is um, uh, it's running off the Microsoft platform or Microsoft SQL or SQL we call it. And so um, those PDM clients um, over the WAN or remote are coming back to this central site to access that SQL server. Even if they have a replicated archive server, like you see in this diagram, um, you would access your files locally. <clears throat> so let's say a PDM user in Europe is accessing and opening the SOLIDWORKS file from their archive server in Europe. However, when they do a search or when they do a where used or contains or a checkout, anytime they're doing a read operation it's, or, or write operation to the data itself, it's sending a lot of traffic back and forth to that central SQL server. In the case of Smith's interconnect, um, this was a scenario that they saw as well during their initial deployment. So initial deployment was in the US um, and then across many sites in Europe and Asia, um, but they just, um, initially deployed um, in SOLIDWORKS PDM Professional 2018 with a central SQL server in the US. And so uh, you can see from this diagram, they have um, uh, eight sites in, in, North, in, in the Americas, seven sites in Europe, two sites in Asia, um, 600 named users using 200 concurrent licenses and with uh, about a half a million files in the vault when they initially went live. And you can see from the diagram, there's lots of um, archive replicas. So it's essentially we're replicating the files <clears throat> so let's say the users in Asia, when they check in a file, that physical file goes to the local server in Asia. Um, and then there's multiple sites that might be actually using a shared archive. And so there's a lot of different locations using a shared archive and taking advantage of more um, localized um, uh, you know, network speeds. So this was their current scenario when they first deployed. Uh, what they ended up finding is um, during that rollout in Asia and Europe, there were some performance issues and some initial investigation showed that they were around a 300 millisecond to Asia in latency and 100, uh, 185 to Europe. Um, and so where something like a copy tree operation uh, would take uh, three and a half minutes when this is something that just takes a few seconds generally uh, in, in, at their primary site. So for large assemblies, which they deal with some large assemblies, it would take minutes and minutes. And in some case, the user would think there's something wrong in the system and close it out. Um, and generally speaking, this would just be for that SQL traffic. So a where use would take 20 seconds, searching, browsing data cards, doing a part number search was taking a bit of time. And you can see there for a six record return on a part number search, it would take 14 seconds. And then um, as an individual user, that maybe wouldn't be as big a deal, but with 50 power users and 300 PDM users um, across Europe and Asia, um, it was starting to become a big issue right away. So they noticed this right away. And in fact, even before the de deployment, they, they um, thought that it might be an issue um, but it definitely um, um, was impacting those users very quickly after the rollout. So the, the solution we worked with with Smiths um, uh, was a solution of two replicated servers, um, one in Europe and one in Asia. And so this would be a replicated SQL server. And so the, um, uh, the SQL server uh, had then various sites connecting to it. And then they still took advantage of their, their um, replicated servers, um, their replicated file servers. Um, there is a question regarding um, uh, can they connect via Citrix? And uh, I actually have, a, I'll, I'll talk about how we can connect to improve performance even more and how we can use other capabilities like Citrix and um, like um, virtual desktops, things like that, to also improve performance as well for individual locations um, or as just a strategy in general. Um, so the main solution for Smiths is we deployed these two 
uh, locations. Um, but there, you know, this was the strategy. Uh, what we wanted to do is first uh, um, uh, build out the two SQL servers, the two additional ones that we would need, additional to the one in the U.S. Um, we decided before making the investment in SQL enterprise licensing, we would want to run this on a development licensing for SQL so we could fully test it out. And uh, following that test, the strategy would be to upgrade the central database in the U.S. to SQL Enterprise and then uh, um, procure those new SQL Enterprise licenses for those replicated sites. So the final structure would essentially look like this. So we would have um, that still primary SQL server in the U.S. that's considered a primary where all write operations occur. And then the read operations for Europe and Asia would go to that replicated SQL server. And that's primarily how the functionality works with SOLIDWORKS PDM and SQL replication. You still have a primary server that everything has to write to, but all the other um, locations can be designated with a, uh, with a server that they can read to. And so most of your operations that you, and, and that may, say, may sound like if I'm checking something in, I'm writing, but a lot of what you're doing from a write standpoint is really in the final transaction. Most of your operations as a user are only read operations. Uh, even in the process of changing state or in checking out a file or doing a copy tree, still most of your interactions with the database are read. Uh, to give you some examples here, all the read uh, write operations at the primary, searching, browsing, opening, running the contains tab, executing templates, changing state. Um, the replica is doing searching, browsing folders, opening files, running the contains tab. But there are elements of those other write operations that are also read. So even our write applications, we get um, uh, we get a lot of benefit by having the SQL replication. And we found that during our testing uh, with Smiths and, and, and doing basic testing as well. Um, so with SQL replication, um, depending on which version of SQL you have, um, there's a little bit different process and there's also some different capabilities. And so if you're using SQL 2012 um, Enterprise Edition, um, you can uh, do four read-only replicas. Um, if you're doing um, SQL 2014 and up, you can do eight secondary replicas. Um, and essentially, we're synchronizing these databases by having a single write database synchronized with all the other ones, again, are considered read-only. And once we configure those databases, we can control how the users will interact which, with which databases um, uh, through the PDM administration tool. Um, so the next part of the presentation is really how we set it up and configure it. Now I'll get into this a lot of details here. What's um, what I'm really hoping um, that you guys get out of it is maybe not the step by step on how to set it up, um, but some tips on how to get resources, um, things to look for, prerequisites, uh, in a way to make sure that you have um, all your bases covered. And, and also some resources where you can reach back to, out to us with questions. Um, and certainly if you do need help and have somebody set this up for you, we have a team of consultants that can help with this. Uh, if you're doing this on your own, that's okay too. It's something that you can reach out to us on support. Um, so to kind of get that part of it started, it really comes down to have, there's a series of prerequisites in order to deploy um, SQL replication. And primarily, it's not really a prerequisite from the SOLIDWORKS PDM side. Um, it's already built into the software there. So you could take advantage of that if you if you have all the prerequisites met. Um, but essentially, you're going to need something uh, greater than a Windows 2012 uh, OS, Windows 2012 server. Um, depending on which version of SQL you have, you may need failover clustering installed and configured. This is a Windows role that you can add. We'll go through that. You're going to need SQL Server Enterprise Edition. Um, this can get quite expensive. And so this is generally, if you want to verify 
that this is going to be the right solution for you, you can set it up in your environment and test using uh, development licenses for SQL uh, to make sure it's going to be um, it's going to get you what you need. And we would definitely recommend doing a test deployment to make sure you understand all the um, pros and cons and also can verify that uh, that you're going to get the performance gains you're looking for. Um, SQL Enterprise Edition is um, approximately 15K, 15,000 per a two core pack, it's called. And um, it's only really sold in this way. And the minimum I think you need to buy um, to invest is, I think, four core. So Microsoft, you know, generally speaking, if you're going to deploy this in, in multiple locations, you're going to need two core packs at each location with a minimum investment of four cores. And so it's um, it's going to cost tens of thousands of dollars to add the SQL Enterprise if you don't already have the licensing available. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we'll show later on that it's definitely worth that investment if you have the right infrastructure. Um, so some things to get prepared for as well. So as you're setting this up, maybe the uh, the person watching this presentation is an administrator, uh, may or may not have the IT expertise. This is something that takes some IT expertise to set up. Um, it's more than just installing SQL. Um, you'll have to have IT resources with the domain admin rights. You need to be able to have admin rights on the servers. If you're going to add failover clustering, it's like adding a server to your network. So you need those type of credentials as well. Um, you need usernames, passwords for everything. So this is something where you'll need to do a bit of most likely a coordinated effort with your IT team. Uh, and this was certainly the case with the uh, Smith's Interconnect team as well. Um, and also we have to make sure that there is um, the right hardware. And so the replicated servers need to be the same setup as your primary. So all the database settings, log path settings, backup strategy, um, all that has to be uh, matched up from primary to secondary. You have to make sure that there's space on the replicated database. Um, there's some things we're going to be changing in the SQL settings. Um, uh, so we need the proper, um, the proper setup for both servers. Um, so if you have a, a certain setup on your primary server, you can't assume that I'm going to set up a secondary and set it up a totally different way and it'll work to, and, and it'll work together. It really will not. So they really have to be configured in the same way. Um, one of the things also to help uh, in when you're doing this rollout is from a database backup, um, like in um, like in some cases, we've seen database backups that may take that might be 20 gig in size. And so if your database backup takes four hours to execute, if you're copying that to the server in China, let's say, um, there might be some different strategies we have to go with. And so um, this is also important to understand um, is to do some tests there as well to see how long things take when we're transferring data to and from these secondary servers. So don't just spin those up. Um, you'll want to basically get those servers going, install SQL, make sure that that's ready to go, test some of the procedures um, before you go ahead and start building it out uh, in your test environment and in your production environment. Um, once you're ready to go, um, you will need to install SQL Server Enterprise. Um, really, uh, there's not a lot of changes you're going to need to make in SQL. You can install it like you install it normally uh, for PDM. Um, that's available to you in your installation guides for your PDM administration. Um, what you will need to do is do what's called an, an addition upgrade. And you can do that under maintenance um, uh, inside of the SQL Server Installation Center. You do your addition upgrade. You can do it on the fly, essentially. Enter your new product key, and that adds the capability that you need. Um, if you have a development key, you can enter that and then you can change that key later on. Um, there's a couple methods you can use in installing uh, the replicated area or adding the replicated capability to the um, um, to the um, SQL database. And you're essentially what you're doing is enabling what are called um, high availability uh, groups to SQL. 
There's a couple, and I'll go through these different methods. And there's also an article on the Solid, SolidWorks Knowledge Base area uh, for customers where you can look up some more of these details. Um, on method two is a bit simpler. We don't need to add failover cluster manager. Um, we have to do what's called uh, adding certificates and creating endpoints. It's a little complicated as far as SQL queries, so you can get those from this knowledge base, um, but um, uh, it does remove the need for doing failover clustering. But if you have licensing for something earlier than 2017 SQL, um, you would need to use the failover cluster method. From a Windows failover clustering, um, essentially you add that as a, um, uh, as a feature under Windows Server. So you're essentially adding um, failover clustering, and I have a screenshot here. You can look this up online as well um, and find instructions on how to add this. Um, but this is essentially a feature that you would add in Windows Server. Um, so it's essentially a group of servers that work together, and it's communicating back and forth and keeping the servers essentially synced up. Um, you can do this for a lot of things, even get down to like actual drive syncing, which we wouldn't do in this case when we set it up. Um, uh, but that's the main intent of this feature. And prior to SQL 17, you needed failover clustering enabled to do this high availability group setup in SQL. Um, you launch that fail once that's installed, you launch the failover cluster manager. And you can do what's called running a validation and set up adding the um, servers. You can all, there's a couple different methods to do it actually. You can add them manually and then validate after, or you can run a validation and add them on the fly. Um, you can go to these um, uh, URLs to actually find that information or find information on how to set it up. Um, it's actually fairly straightforward. You do need some permissions as I'll show on the next slide. Um, once validated, you can build the cluster. And so if and what it should look like is a couple different nodes. I have two nodes showed here. And you can see the status, those nodes, you know, the, being up means they're connected. Um, each one of these um, um, uh, servers will have an IP. The, the cluster itself will also need an IP. So you'll be designated an IP and a name for this cluster. And the name is essentially um, has an IP address and you can ping it on the network basically. Um, so um, to add the IP and add this cert, what amounts to like a server name on the network, you'll need proper permissions for that from an IT side. Um, once you have that server, that cluster, um, available, you can connect to it from your secondary and tertiary servers. And so your other SQL servers, which um, already have SQL installed or ready to go, uh, you can connect to the cluster from there once it's configured. Um, if the machines cannot see each other, you're, you wouldn't be able to create that replicated, that, that failure of cluster in the first place. So presumably here, this should be um, a connect the cluster um, and it'll show, it'll allow, there's an area where you can type it in and then it'll just be connected, connected and it'll be stored here in your history. At this point, the, the uh, cluster should be able to um, uh, stay together and stay connected. Uh, even if you reboot the servers, they should come up and be connected again. Um, this can be an issue um, and we've seen the cluster fail in instances where you might have um, your uh, pat your Windows patching out of sync. So if let's say your clustering feature is not at the same patch level, so you've patched your US server but didn't patch your Asia server, they can get out of sync. And we've seen this bring the cluster down. And if the cluster drops and doesn't connect, then your SQL server doesn't connect. Um, so uh, your and your SQL replication will stop working. So um, uh, this is something to remember as well, is that you want to make sure the OS and patching is all done um, at the same patch level. 
Um, if you have SQL 2017 and above, you can actually run different queries to create the high, avail high availability access for SQL, but you're doing it by creating um, what are called certificates and endpoints. Um, now it gets into uh, the real technical details very quickly, but essentially your endpoints are being used um, to connect your SQL servers and your certificates are being used for authentication, to authenticate between um, those servers as well. So using um, SQL queries, it, um, and we can provide those queries to you, it makes it a lot easier to set up and it also removes that failure point of having um, the failover clustering. So if you don't have to worry about failover clustering going down, that takes one point of failure out. Right. And so um, for our customers deploying um, SQL 2017 or greater, we're able to do that. And in the case of Smith's Interconnect, um, we, we initially deployed them using um, the failover clustering method. And for their upgrade and new servers being deployed for 2020, um, we are using this new method. And that's currently in their test environment right now. So we run a query at the primary server, which creates the certificates. That's the query you see on the left side from the secondary and then an additional servers. We're running a um, um, additional query for those certificates. And you can see if you look at the details of these queries, you can see there's some differences in the uh, naming of the certificate. So you have different certificates named and stored on each server. So you need a folder for saving those. So you create that folder. Um, and then what you do is you copy the certificates from this, each server to the other servers. And so um, all the servers need to have a copy of the certificates back at the primary and the primary certificate needs to be at those other servers. And then what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna run additional queries to load those certificates. And then we're going to grant that, that credential to what's called a SQL endpoint. And again, it's, it can get complicated. You can do some research uh, on this um, uh, from the Microsoft site on you know, what an endpoint is and what these certificates do. But essentially, this is um, connecting the two and adding that authorization layer. Um, and again, you can refer back to, uh, you can give us a call, you can refer back to these knowledge base articles as well, because it has a little bit more explanation. And you can also, again, copy, there's the text there, so you can actually copy paste that into your SQL query tool. Instead of looking at the screenshot here and trying to rewrite. Once you're there, uh, once that's configured, uh, in either case, you, whether you use method one or method two to essentially add the functionality for high, high availability groups, um, you will then need to add this capability to your SQL server or to your actual SQL service that's running right now. So, so far you've uh, added that capability, you've added the, um, uh, the enterprise function to the SQL system itself. So by um, upgrading it to this enterprise edition, so you would go to your SQL server that's running, and this is this in what's called the SQL Server Configuration Manager. You, go, you right click on the service that's running, go to Properties. And what you would see there, if it's set up properly, is a checkbox where you could say, Enable Always On Availability Groups. If you are using a um, Windows failover, your failover cluster name would be visible in this screen. That's method one. If you use method two, you could go ahead and check this box. You could enable it, but you'll see a message that says in the box, this computer is not a node for failover cluster. If you didn't do this right, you most likely won't have a checkbox at all. So you, it'll be grayed out. So you, um, you know, that's where you might need to go back and look at your notes and make sure you didn't miss a step. With method two, um, you're most likely good to go there. Um, for method one, if you are using, um, uh, so not using certificates, 
um, you may need to, and this is not guaranteed, but you may need to um, uh, go ahead and add a domain login on that SQL process as well. So you can right click in, on the process in SQL on that service and go into the login tab under that service and change that to a domain login. And typically this would be somebody with, do, with administrator right on each service or on each SQL server and a password that's not gonna expire because if it expires, then your service goes down. Um, and so, um, this would be recommended to, again, it helps these two services communicate and authenticate with one another. Um, the certificate that you deploy in method uh, two, like I've showed before, um, has that, that um, communication already bridged. So it's not really an issue, um, but you obviously do need to create that certificate. Um, if you went through method one with the clustering, you also have to verify that that's online. Uh, and if that's okay, um, you can you can move forward. What you also need to do from a SQL standpoint is make sure all your settings are the same. And I mentioned this before, but your SQL database and log paths have to be identical. So if it's a C drive or a D drive, you need that identical on both servers. Um, everything has to match all the way to the path to the file name of the database and the log file. Um, so everything ha has to match entirely. Um, especially if you're using automatic or backup restore during sync, uh, everything has to match um, um, during the whole process. So you can see I have, um, uh, if you go to your PDM vault, you're going to see your PDM vault has a path location. And, but if you go to the server properties of your server, you have what are called database settings that apply to, to all the databases on this on that system. And here's where you update that data and log file or log paths. Um, you also have to change the uh, what's called the recovery model of your database. And so you're going to change it from simple if you have it currently simple to full. And this essentially enables transaction logging um, for the databases. It's called the database recovery model has to be set to full. So once that occurs, you can now go through the wizard. And so on your on your database, and let's say your PDM database is called PDM rep, like is in my screenshot here. You're also going to have this Kinesio master DB. So that's going to be sitting in there as well. You're going to have down a little bit in your SQL interface, something called always on high availability groups. It's going to look like a folder. And what you can do is right click on that and select new availability group wizard. Um, this is not a, a SOLIDWORKS type of um, a process. This is a SQL process. So you can find information on how to do this um, on the Microsoft site. And there's lots and lots of uh, blogs and things on how to do this kind of stuff. Um, but this is a good way to go. This is pretty straightforward, really. So you go new availability group wizard. Um, you're going to give your group a name. So this is like um, your synchronization group, right? And so then you're going to have, um, uh, so you're going to give it a name. You're going to select the database that gets added to it. So uh, you don't really need to select your Kinesio master DB. This thing is not changing. So there really needs to be no replication. Um, if you have PDM professional, and have multiple, you would have multiple here. If you have something like PDM Manage, it also supports replication, so you can add that as well. So it's gonna add it to the list, and then we need to select Add Replica. So when we do the Add Replica, it's gonna ask you to authenticate as, uh, to this site, uh, to that secondary server, which you would do. Use the same credentials as you did in the primary. So then you would connect to that. You would add it to the list and call it a secondary. And then what you're going to do is you're going to mark these both to what's called a asynchronous commit. So that means the primary does not wait for the secondary updates to complete. So this would be in those high latency WAN environments. Um, so that's going to be what we're going to be using here. 
um, and we're going to be flagging our primary ser server to a no, and the secondary and the third and fourth server, if needed, are going to be flagged as yes. So those are readable only. So those replicas are going to be set as readable. That's a key as well in the setup. The next part of it is where it gets a bit complicated. So um, in order to um, synchronize the two servers initially, so you have a database at your primary, but at your secondary server, all you did was install SQL. So you really don't have um, a, a database there yet. So to get the database from the primary to the secondary, you do something um, that's that's called seeding or you can do seeding or essentially you have to do the data synchronization and it defaults to use automatic seeding and automatic seeding once you proceed will go to will attempt to create the database on your secondary system and start syncing them if you have pretty decent network and your database is not very big then this may be just fine so this is something you'd want to test in your test environment to see if this is going to be OK. Um, the next option is you can do a full database and log backup. And it takes a data, it takes a backup uh, of the database and the log. And you have to have a shared drive. And part of the interface will show you that. There'll be like a shared path where you can, where both servers can have access. And then what it will do when you click next and start the process, it'll have the secondary database or secondary SQL server restore that database and start to sync. And it'll go to that same network share. So that network share needs to be available from both locations, from both logins. Um, the uh, third option is called join only. And that assumes you already have the database restored on the secondary. So you do your backup of your primary. Then as a user, you physically copy it over to the secondary, restore it to the secondary server, and then you do what's called a join. So the database is already there and already restored and ready to go. You're just joining two existing databases. Um, so the seeding automatic and the full database are the easiest. So you can just run with those if it makes sense. However, if your database is large and you have poor latency or poor network, or sometimes your network times out, um, it'll just fail the process. And so, and there's no real way to undo that. And so you'll have to kind of blow away your um, high availability group and start again. So if your database is large and you fail on either the automatic seeding or the full database and log backup, um, you'll need to go to the join only method. And uh, in that, this is what we used for Smith's Interconnect um, uh, because there it took way too long to do the full database log backup or automatic seeding that the system would essentially time out. Um, so for Smith's, um, we used the join option because the database was 11 gigabytes. Um, the um, for join synchronization uh, again uh, i'll just reiterate the database path settings must be the bo both the same on on the primary and secondary servers um, when we initially did this in our test the way uh, the uh, server was set up it didn't have an e-drive and so we needed to create an e-drive um, and so uh, we needed to reconfigure the drive setup on their virtual server um, so it's important to know that that's what you need in advance so to make sure you don't slow the process down. Um, a domain user um, used for the SQL process what needed to be a system, system admin on both. And the SA password in SQL had to match. So these are um, some of your prerequisites for using join. Um, so for using join, you have to then back up your PDM professional database. Now, remember, we set the recovery model to full, so it's going to back up the primary and everything and the, and the log. Um, you're going to need to restore those from the primary to the secondary. Um, you're going to restore the database on the secondary server, and you're going to set, you're going to restore it instead of restoring it like normal. 
you're going to restore it with recovery. So when as a restore option, there's something called a recovery state. And you're going to flip that to say restore with no recovery. And once you're completed with that restore, it's going to flag the database with an arrow and this parentheses behind the database saying restoring essentially means the database is unusable at the secondary site. Um, so uh, if it doesn't restore in this model, let's say you forget that, you won't be able to use the join. It'll show the database is in a read write state and you can't join them. So the database has to be in this restoring state. Once you've done all that, you can then go back to the, um, the synchronization type in the wizard and start moving forward and say, okay, this is a this is a join and then move forward in your steps. And depending on which synchronization method you use, it'll, it'll um, show success. Um, in some cases, as you're running through the process, it'll validate things like seeding is taking place um, and, and kind of show that process. If you use the join method, it's essentially going to skip over that stuff because it won't need to do the seeding because you've already um, placed the database back up and restored it on that secondary server. So it's going to run through a series of validation um, and you're going to hit uh, next a couple times and then it's going to uh, show that it's finished. Once this is done, um, you're going to see uh, this completed here in the um, uh, in the summary. So you can export this out to a text file or something like that as a summary. And then once you go to your databases, um, you're going to see it look like this as well. So you're always on an availability group. What you see here called PDM Sync. I'll highlight that. So this PDM sync is the name that you entered in, in when you're creating the group. And then you're going to see in both of those cases, you're going to see synchronization here. And if it shows looking like this, uh, where it looks like it's um, it's synchronizing, then you know you're good. If you see anything like a red X, that's obviously something telling you that it's not synchronizing. And this could happen even... Um, if for some reason you lose your high availability synchronization, even, you know, let's say a month after you have this going in production, all of a sudden um, you notice that this is, um, um, that something is happening and the users have slowed down suddenly, it could be that your, your synchronization has stopped. That you can also see on what's called a dashboard. So, you're going to see your database is going to show synchronizing on, on your secondary servers. You're going to see um, uh, there's a dashboard. When you right click on that high availability group, you can go to the dashboard and it'll show you green everywhere. If you've seen something other than green at any of your additional sites, um, it may be that you've um, uh, you either didn't set it up right or let's say it's green today, but in a few weeks you look back and something is red and it's not synchronizing. It could be that um, uh, the connection between the servers possibly timed out because maybe a server went down and then was brought back up later, something like that. What that can do is it can pause your synchronization. And so if it's trying to synchronize and it can't and times out, it'll pause the secondary synchronization and you'll need to go in and restart that. So you'll, there's basically a button to click to say resume transfer, and it will start moving the data again. Um, uh, but it could be those users might be affected negatively um, if you didn't notice that the synchronization had stopped. Um, and we'll go over a little bit later the timing wise, but let's say a user, let's say your secondary site does go down for some reason, and the users that are connected to that site Obviously, you, you want them to be able to still use PDM. It will default them back to the primary while you get the secondary site brought back up. Once this is all good, you're going to go into PDM Pro.
And there's something called, there's a replication area in PDM Professional Administration Tool. Um, you're going to have the archive area where you configure your archive schemas. And then there's something called the database. Um, you're going to double click on that. You're going to identify the server that you're going to be pointing to. And then you need to hit, hit the button test settings. Until you click test settings where it's able to communicate with that secondary server, you can't do anything else. And so uh, you have to make sure to do that to make sure that communication is happening. Then you're also going to add users or groups that will connect to this server. So essentially, the you, you and in the case of Smith, what we did as well is you create a group. Now, this wouldn't be a group that's security based. Certainly, it can overlap. But let's say uh, you have a group with all the users in China already in that group or in Europe, all those users are in that group already. Um, you would point that group to that site in Europe or site in Asia, whatever, you know, whatever makes sense. And so then for that user group, every user in that group, when they log into the system and when they're searching and performing all those read operations, they would point to the secondary or whatever server you've assigned. Um, users attached to the primary would still attach to the primary. If somebody is in um, uh, in both groups, last assignment uh, wins, essentially. So um, uh, if a user um, uh, or if, let's say, a specific user, you can assign that specific user, and that's called an explicit assignment. And then that overwrites what you've assigned as well. In addition, you also have to define a, a lag and a max lag. And so essentially this max lag, um, so if, a, um, if the lag time uh, uh, exceeds this maximum value, all read and write are directed to primary SQL. So the current lag is something that's measured um, by the system. So the system is measuring, okay, what is that right now? And then you would you would flag, OK, if it exceeds the max lag I've defined, that means I got an issue and default all the users back to the primary. Uh, here's a few references as well um, for creating the availability group using the SQL wizard, um, setting up clustering using a work group. So let's say you're trying to do this. Uh, let's say you need to use the clustering method, but you don't have a domain. Um, you have a work group set up. Maybe you're doing some testing. There's some. Uh, tips for doing that. And then also, um, again, a, a, a resources for setting up that failover cluster if you need to go to that method. In addition, um, setting up the login accounts to connect to the endpoint, that's on SQL Server 2017. Again, some additional um, articles for reference purposes. From the SOLIDWORKS side, um, there's also some knowledge base uh, articles here as well. For you to reference. Um, if you don't have access to these, uh, contact our support team. We can get you some articles on these, get you the details if you need it. Um, so uh, also if you are setting it up and you get some troubleshooting issues, um, you can also call us. Uh, in some cases, it's going to be very hard for us to determine that on support. So we may need to um, assign a consultant to help out. But um, um, but generally, there's the resources available to, you know, to get through the process. Also in the replication guide, there is some information as well that's uh, included on your, uh, on your download of your PDM professional. Um, so skipping forward a bit to the justification. And so um, with SQL Enterprise being a very costly um, a piece of software to buy, and in addition, you need a enterprise licensing, multiple cores of that, and you need that at every location, including your primary needs to be upgraded. It can be a bit of a costly endeavor, and so if, as an organization, you're you're wanting to spend you know somewhere north of fifty thousand dollars on SQL licensing, obviously you want to make sure you can justify it, and the really the justification comes in. Uh, to really identifying the use cases of the individual users that are um, 
that are using the software at those those remote locations. Or um, so it's identifying that use case, and and in addition, identifying the number of users kind of working through that use case. So it's, it comes down to defining an appropriate use case that you can measure against. And even if it's not um, a scenario where you have a lot of remote users, but you have a lot of users at your primary site and they're really hammering S, you know, your SQL server, you could also um, build a use case there and then do your testing with SQL replication enabled and SQL replication disabled. Once you have SQL replication all installed, it's really easy to test because you can log in as a user in, in at your remote site as a user in a replicated group. And as you saw in the steps, on the previous steps, you're assigning people by groups to point to different servers. So you can take that away and add that to their um, uh, to their um, uh, basically their assignment in their group very quickly. So I could turn it on and off for a user within a few seconds, and they could tell me what kind of differences they saw in performance. So it's very easy to do the measurements. Um, for Smith's interconnect, this is the, the general scenario we did for China, and then we replicated this scenario for Europe when we brought them online with their SQL Server as well. And essentially, we wanted to really test the following. Um, they did a lot of um, same as except um, type of operations. So I have an assembly that I'm working with uh, in the US, and they're going to do a China version of that, let's say, or a custom version for a specific type of customer or application. So they would take an assembly and they would do a copy tree. So a same as except, and then open up that new copy in SOLIDWORKS and start designing. So it was very important for them to be able to do a copy tree on large assemblies. So when you do that, you're going to do a login. You're going to browse to the folder, possibly search, um, find the file that you're looking for to do your copy tree. You may do a couple things like do a where use a contains to see, OK, is there something else I need to be looking at? Um, then you're going to run your copy tree. Then that's going to get checked in. And then you're going to change state to um, to release it or to basically flag that you're done with it. So those are a common set of uh, scenario that they would do. Now, this process, you know, back and forth in the vault, uh, obviously in the vault, they're not using the vault all day. Primarily, they're using SOLIDWORKS. And so they're they're using their CAD tool and they're working at it. But out of uh, going back and forth in the vault to do various uh, operations, they would see themselves in the vault maybe, um, you know, uh, you know, most of the day, but typically um, because of the lag time, where somebody in the U.S. at the primary server would maybe only be spending 30 minutes in the vault each day, and most of the rest of the time they are using their CAD tool. So that's kind of the scenario we went, we started with when doing the measurements. Um, so we did measurements and we did the different scenarios with replication on and and replication off. And essentially, this is what you see here. Um, so what I'm doing here is running a video of uh, the same operations from their China location with no database replication on the left and database replication enabled on the right. And you can see if I'm just looking to perform the same functions, I'm already way ahead. You can see I can run contains, I can do my copy tree, and I'm already starting my copy tree process with database replication, even before I've even gotten through the browsing on the left side. And now I'm doing a where used on the left. You can see it's taking a long time to run the query back to the US. And they're already moving forward with the process of the copy tree on the right side. So now they're copying files. So this is read and write operations. But it finished it. It created a new folder to check the files in. Now they're doing a change state on the right, while on the left, I've just now selected my copy tree. 
So on the right, it changed the uh, replication or the state to pre-release, which then can push that forward in the um, uh, in the process for them. So the user on the right, they're done. Um, so they've moved on and they're looking at their next assembly or working in SOLIDWORKS or whatever they need to do. So this operation took a while. So on the left, we still got a bit of a spinning wheel because it was going to build the reference list needed for the copy tree. So now we're at the copy tree. And so we're performing this, this operation. So he's creating a new folder. That's going to take just a bit. Again, this is 300 plus milliseconds in latency to China connecting to the SQL database um, in the US. So created the folder. They're going to do some of their assignments in the copy tree. And even during a copy tree, even though you're in this interface, it's constantly communicating back to the database because it's checking things like permissions. It's checking whether or not it's a duplicate, stuff like that. And so it's gone through the process here. See, we get a few spinning wheels. And meanwhile, the person is like this. They're just you know, shaking their head because uh, the user on the right that had database replication enabled for their login, they're already done and they're moving on. While this person on the left is, you know, working late trying to get this uh, operation done. Now picture this with an assembly that's a couple hundred files as opposed to an assembly with just a few files. Um, and you'll see essentially what, you know, the difference. And so I'll kind of skip forward a little bit. And you can see it's copying the files, still copying more files, still copying more files. It's still going. Finally finishes that. And our last operation that we're going to do is a change state. And so it's running through the change state operation. And normally people would think change state is a, re a write operation, not a read. So how is it different? Well, there's a lot of um, interaction that still has to happen in SQL from a read perspective. And so it's doing that in read and then sending the writes back um, to the primary. So those primary interactions are probably a bit slower but as a user, you really can't tell. So what we ended up finding through these exercises is that things like browsing folders were, were twice as fast. Where use was, was a lot, lot faster from 20 seconds to one second. Contains tab, four seconds to two, copy tree. That whole operation took us about 201 seconds to go through. And we were able to get it down to 30 seconds um, when using replication. Um, 36 seconds for change state, eight seconds for change state with replication. So you can see the kind of savings that we're able to get with this kind of scenario. And it really translates well. And so um, as you get a bigger assembly, instead of taking 201 seconds, it might have been, um, you know, hundreds and hundreds of seconds. So you might be getting up to um, six minutes, 10 minutes to run that. Um, but with the copy tree, um, with the replication, um, you're going to see that savings essentially exponentially grow. So the so even the the bigger the the um, the number on the where there's no database replication, you might see greater than 80% savings and might even increase. Um, so to really um, justify it for yourselves and for your environment, it really comes down to, um, like I was saying, come up with that scenario that makes sense, something that people are doing in a common way, using assembly sizes that are common. So don't pick an assembly that is the worst assembly you've ever opened or the smallest assembly you've ever opened. So pick something that's that everybody can appreciate. This is what people do every day. Um, and um, and try to put it in perspective of how many times they do that particular function 
and turn that, what we've done is, is really turn that into how much time you spend in the vault each day. Because not every user is going to be using copy tree in your company. Maybe some people are just searching or they do a lot of template um, uh, processes. So come up with some varying scenarios that are going to, going to be cross-functional and make sure you can demonstrate that there's real savings there and then use that in a way to make your justification. And so, um, so the scenario we use is approximately 30 minutes of a user working in the vault in the, in the, where the primary server was, in this case, it was in the US. So they were doing copy trees, they were searching. And so general feedback from the users is that there's about 30 minutes that we're in the vault each day. The rest of the time we're, we're working with our engineering teams on other issues, we're working in SolidWorks, uh, but 30 minutes we're doing vault activity. Um, but to do that same job remotely, so let's say in this case in China, they would have to spend 135 minutes or almost two hours doing the same work. So what ended up happening is they just wouldn't do the work. Um, so they would so they would move on to other things um, or the system would crash in the middle. So they'd have to come back and restart. So it became very frustrating. Um, in our example, we did this, the study for just 20 users at the remote site, um, $30 an hour uh, US per hour is a fully burdened rate. I know that's going to vary for Europe and for uh, the US. Um, and for this particular setup is around $70,000 in SQL cost, an additional 20,000 in additional hardware. And so um, uh, because as we were building out our full justification, we also needed to consider labor costs and keeping the hardware up and going and additional costs for those virtual servers and licensing and, and, and everything. So we're talking around 100,000 um, to get it set up for these um, for these sites. Um, so 20 users saving 35 hours. Um, you can see it's about $1,000 per day savings, and to pay off the entire enterprise for their China site um, is approximately 18 to 20 weeks. And so depending on um, you know how that works uh, as far as your ROI, that'll help in, obviously in your justification. Um, it doesn't help you necessarily pay for it. So you still need to come up with the, um, the upfront um, uh, money to pay uh, for the SQL licensing, but you can see there really is a true um, a payoff in productivity. And in the case of Smiths, it really was more making the system usable versus not usable. So the payoff was really more than this. It allowed the teams in China to collaborate with the teams in the US, uh, which just really wasn't possible um, the way it was initially deployed. Um, so to kind of summarize on that, so obviously um, the cons uh, were really, you know, the complexity that it's gonna to add to the environment. Um, we have a lot of our customers that can, that can manage their environment with really just a part-time person. That may change a bit if you have to add this complexity, you're gonna to need to get IT resources involved and um, gonna to need to pay a bit more attention. For If you have um, uh, multiple locations located around the world, you might already have dedicated admins, dedicated IT resources towards this, so it might not be too much more. Um, it requires additional testing. It requires testing, more testing during the upgrade process. And obviously the biggest con is it re requires additional licensing cost for SQL Enterprise. Um, and, um, and oftentimes um, if it's something that maybe as you're getting ready to launch a new site, something you didn't consider as part of your justification and so, or a part of your budgeting. And so um, I would say if you are gonna add new sites um, down the road, um, these are things that you have to consider. Uh, it's at least budgeting for this and that's really what we did in the case of Smiths. We budgeted for SQL Enterprise. Um, and then um, that way we, we had the appropriate budgets available when, um, um, when the initial uh, launch showed that we needed it, uh, we were able to quickly get it deployed. Um, the pros, of course, it, it pays for itself very quickly. Um, it enhances the user experience. So you get more people using the vault, you get more out of the tool and the investment that you've made. Um, it also decreases the load on all the SQL servers. 
So instead of sending every single user in the entire world, let's say it's 500 users, all the way back to a single server for even searching, you're distributing that load across multiple servers. So essentially you're adding more processing to your network of SQL interaction. So even if you didn't have remote situations where high latency existed, um, you can still get a lot out of it because let's say you had 200 users that are searching all day, you could push all those users to your secondary SQL server and have all the SOLIDWORKS users on your primary and it would make the SOLIDWORKS users experience better and the searching and the, the shop floor users or the people searching, their experience would also be better. Uh, some final thoughts from the Smith side. Um, at the time when we were running this uh, in, um, uh, did this presentation in February, uh, Asia and Europe performing well. They're using the vault successfully. They were able to take advantage of this SQL replication very well. Um, and, um, but a, as a um, side note as well, uh, Smith is also exploring virtual desktops. And somebody had a question earlier about Citrix. Um, uh, but Citrix and other tools can be used if, um, depending on that, that user scenario. So if they're going to be searching, if let's say your remote users are only searching, um, a, Citrix, a Citrix interface may work, work fine. And it's going to be much faster and much more cost effective to deploy a system like that because you're just over the remote, uh, you're just transmitting the, um, the view of the access to the client. You're not transmitting the data, the SQL queries. So, um, and the same with a virtual desktop. So if you deploy virtual desktops um, uh, in, your, uh, in your environment, they're connecting to the primary from a virtual desktop and that, that latency doesn't exist then. So it's a different type of scenario. It's not without its own cost. Um, where these kind of things don't work or where it's harder for them to work is when you have a SOLIDWORKS client and they have their own um, workstation and user session. So when you do that, um, you have to make sure when the user launches that session again, they have the same files local that they were working on yesterday, et cetera. So you need more of that virtual desktop mode than a Citrix mode, at least more in conventional sense. And so um, to do a virtual desktop um, versus SQL replication is just really a function of how many users in those locations and can we justify adding that additional SQL licensing. Um, so you could see from our scenario, 20 users, we were able to justify it. Uh, but if we only had, let's say, one user and that user was, let's say, in Malaysia, um, certainly we want that user's experience to be the best we can. But if we cannot, uh, we may not be able to justify putting SQL replication at their location um, with that expense of another $20,000, let's say. But for them, we may be able to deploy a single virtual desktop for a couple hundred dollars a month and have that virtual desktop connecting directly to the primary server. They would get really good performance at a very low monthly cost. So with the virtual desktop functionality that's available now, and we're deploying that for some of our customers, it really adds another element that we can take advantage of um, so that we don't have to go to just SQL replication if there's an issue with latency. Uh, and with that, um, you can also email me um, at this email address and I can get um, answers to your questions, um, even in, in reference to the Smiths questions. If you have any questions about how Smiths move forward with their um, replication environment or, or just general questions, you can submit those to me.